Good morning, viewers. Welcome to Frankly Speaking with Vibhuti Jha. Today is the last program of the year, 2019. So, in advance and before everything else gets over, let me greet you that your 2020 is better than what you had in 2019. Instead of just saying Happy New Year, I pray and I wish that you have a 2020 which is definitely better than what you had in 2019. With these greetings, let's kick off the last program of the day, of this year actually, and talk about issues that have been plaguing India, the world, and the issues to celebrate. The good and the bad, they all move together. Nothing happens in isolation. If I were an Indian and I was looking at 2019, I'm looking at it from the point of view that such cataclysmic events were handled by the current government in a remarkably professional way. So think about one of the biggest events of 2019 is Mr. Modi's re-election with a thumping majority once again in 2019. People of India restored their faith and trust in Prime Minister Modi to carry on his agenda for Sabka Saat, Sabka Vikas, Sabka Vishwas. That was a very powerful message the Indians received in the year 2019. What is important here is, the, the, if you look at the achievements of Prime Minister Modi and things that he has done for India, including what was the Kashmir issue of 370 and 35A, it is important to remember these problems were considered to be completely intractable and supposedly insolvable, because even people had said that it will take him 100 years to do that. But with the adroitness, legal finesse, with which he did that deserves a wonderful applause for every Indian and people from around the world must acknowledge that a troubled area has been integrated and given equality with the rest of the state. That's a point which people miss out. They focus on the supposed human rights violations, but they forget that the pursuit of life, liberty and happiness has to begin with pursuing life first. So a lot of things have happened we will talk about that. We will also talk about certain issues which are currently bedeviling India and we will kick off with that conversation on citizen bill, citizenship bill that was passed in both houses of parliament, which by itself, there is nothing wrong in it, but the way the opposition party has been creating ruckus around the country, that needs to be paid attention to. So to spending the day today with me is Dr. Deepak Nandi. Dr. Deepak Nandi, welcome to the program. Uh, you know, I'm very delighted that you found time to come for the last program of the year. And uh, you know, he is, not only he is a doctor, he is also a very active social member of the community. And you know, he, he, the one thing which I like about him a lot, he speaks from his heart and his mind is in his place. So as a result of which he's not afraid to tell the truth, even if it is an unpleasant truth. And that's something which is important in a media setup where things are not treated on a, you know, on an equal basis. So, Doctor, welcome. Thank you for those kind words. Thank you very much. <laughs> you know, it, it always takes two to tango. So, let's talk about the Citizenship Amendment Bill that came about and is an act now. Why is the opposition talking about and creating fear psychosis in the country, especially when one sentence we can put it that there is no provision in, these, in the bill which anyway debtors the capacity of Indian citizens from discharging their duty. They are not affected at all. Correct. Well, I have my own theory behind the whole thing. Uh, after Modi won his election way back in the month of May, he has been scoring sixers time and again. He first did the Teen Talaq bail which was done before, then he successfully implemented Article 370, which was a huge sixer, it could not be even visualized that it could have been up, would be done in the next 50 years or 100 years, like you said. He did that Article 370. Then the Supreme Court came and the Ram Mandir court decision came in favor of the Hindus. And then he passed this bill. And I think... <coughs> 
because this happened too fast and too quick in succession, Article 370 in August, then comes the new bill of the Ram Mandir in September, and come November you have the Citizenship Act. The, the media, the left capitalized on the left media and make a big, big deal out of it, even though they knew the messaging was not being done correctly. Because what this act basically says is that if you are from these three countries, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Bangladesh, because these are Islamist countries, if you have come from these countries, you cannot seek asylum based on religious persecution. That was the only message, that how can you be religiously persecuted if you came from Afghanistan, Bangladesh, or Pakistan? You're talking You're, about the Muslims. Yeah, the Muslims. Right, right, if right. any Muslims had come from these three countries and is wanting Indian citizenship based on <clears> religious <throat> persecution, you will not be able to get uh, the citizenship because it just does not pass the muster. The, the muster is basically how can you be persecuted religiously in those nations. But if you are a Hindu, a Jain, Sikh, uh, a, a Buddhist or any other Christian, any other religious denomination, Besides Islamist, besides being a Muslim, and if you had come from those countries and are living in India without a citizenship, you can apply for Indian citizenship based on the argument that you were religiously persecuted in those countries, which we know is true. I mean, we have hundreds of thousands of Hindus, Sikhs who were killed in Pakistan, who were killed in Afghanistan, and so in Bangladesh. So that was, it, it was very right, it was very simple. But my philosophy is because the Teen Talaq bill happened, then the uh, Article 370 happened, then uh, you had the Ram Mandir decision, it, it just came out politically incorrect messaging and the left capitalized on the media because the media were already complaining in there is no independence for the uh, the Muslims in Srinagar, in Kashmir, and things like that, and it was just a tipping factor. So do you think? Do you think it happened too soon, or do you think that the messaging was not done appropriately? So uh, is it, there is an important issue here. The issue is that you know the entire effort. See, Mr. Modi is a karma yogi. I said this in in 2014. This man is not going to sit idle. He is not. He is the kind of man which reminds me of John F. Kennedy's very, very famous inspiring speech when the United States was preparing to land on moon. You know, his statement was that we are not doing this because it's easy to go to moon. We are doing this because it's difficult to do so. So that is the message. That's where the inspiration comes that you have to do things which are tough. And Mr. Modi has chosen to do very, very tough things which were completely not supposed to happen. Correctly. So as a result of which, Prime Minister Modi is the face of the entire effort that is happening along with Amit Shah. I feel, and I, I concur with you on this matter, that the messaging had to be adroit, had to be polished, and had to be correct. Now, the point here is not that Modi and Amit Shah did anything wrong, but you have to remember that politicians who are in your opposition, they want to take advantage of whatever is offered in the plate. And as a result of which, they made it as a human rights issue, they made it as a you know, minority majority issue, but they fail on one aspect, that they did not, you know, the, the beauty of the whole process is that people will begin to see that. And that's what is important to Prime Minister and Amit Shah ji, must develop a cadre of people, that Rajnath Singh and everybody else, must be speaking to the people. When the act was passed, they should have immediately gone into the field to talk about this entire thing. You are 100% you are correct. The messaging was, had to be improved, what I would say. But imagine again, in life, everything has to do with timing. Politically thinking about timing issue is very important. Like I said, the messaging had to be clear that only based on these three Muslim nations, you can, uh, cannot uh, uh, ask for uh, asylum based on religious persecution. 
but it was also the left media had already started having a lot of articles. We were seeing articles in New York Times and all over the Western media, BBC, Guardian, which were all tilted against Modi. Right. And, and this was the tipping factor. And that was the last straw that broke the camel's back. At and that brings me to other part of the thing. You brought about New York Times and the media part of it, which is the big, big relevant issue that why does, do these people, why does this media sermonize only India about human rights? Pramila Jaipal, Ro Khanna, so many other uh, you know, yeah. congressmen, they talked about human rights violation or discrimination against Muslims. They made it sound as if India was, Modi was anti-Muslim, but Modi has never spoken anything about against Muslims. He has always talked about his mool mantra of sabka vikas, sabka saath, sabka vishwas. When he's doing that, what is it the trigger in the left? Is it the fear that this man is so determined to pursue the path which is anti-liberal, supposedly, it's not anti-liberal, but it's supposedly they takes the, you know, food from the table, they don't have any issues to fight on, so they begin to contest on these matters. So, <coughs> this is like a three-dimensional chess, as I would say. You have to see this in three factors. There is one factor which I had mentioned last time that the West expects a lot from India. The West sees India as a land of Buddhas, as a land of Mahavir Jain, as a land of Gandhi. And it is a land which always takes the high road. It is a land which does not persecute but tolerates. The Western civilization has always seen India because of its non-violent movement for last 3,000 years has always perceived India as a land of non-violence. Now you mix that with this new uh, lekhas that Mr. Modi has defined that this, these are, I mean, we will reply, look at the Balkot event, Balkot event, that we will reply a bullet with a bullet. We will not kill the Pakistani citizens, but we will go to the terrorist camp and demolish the terrorist camp and come back and just claim that we did it. And there is nothing wrong with that. This was something that was never done before. So the Western media has perceived India that now there is a new face of India, an India which takes action, which is Kam Yogi, which Lord Krishna had always proposed, and uh, uh, but India never did that. So like India, when Shubhas Chandra Bose had the Indian National Army, the West did not perceive it as good. The West, although I, have, I claim that the Indian National Army had a big contribution in terms of the independence of India, but it was always perceived by the Western media as somebody co-Nazi, the branded, and they had nothing to do right. with the Nazi party. Right. So, so the West has a lot of expectation. And the last thing that I would have call it a three-dimensional chess is that, that the pack, the super pack of the Muslim community in the West is huge. They have collected huge amount of money and have paid to the politicians for the politicians like Ro Khanna to tilt to their side, for Pratima and Jayapal to tilt towards that side. So here you have these politicians, then the Western media amalgating to that kind of concept. And what you get is a final product where they are demonizing Modi. And That's this is the issue here, because what has happened is that Prime Minister Modi has changed the narrative of all the issues that Deepak was mentioning right now, is whether it was uh, the assertiveness of India or sermonizing on India or all these stuff that was going on as if India had to bear and live with the burden of peace alone. And everybody can treat India as a happy hunting ground for everything that hurt India. So think about it like this point of view that while we were the peace lovers, we were invaded. We were supposed to be peaceful, but they invaded. The British East India Company invaded. They all ruled India. So for the, us, the compliant, docile Hindu cannot raise a, 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 raise a sword to defend itself. That's the narrative which is changing. And for that, it was important for Prime Minister Modi to discipline things 
that were going out of control. The left, which was having a field day in India, the media, they are now finding that they can't do the same narration again and again because in a technology-driven world that we live in, news gets, reaches the places that the truth comes out very easily. And you can now see the news and verify it. So much so that, that a Muslim dressed as a Sikh is on WhatsApp in a matter of minutes. That's the issue which is very important. Stay tuned. We will be back right after this short break. Welcome back. Continuing our dialogue, one of the important issues that happens is that we Indians generally are very compliant, quiet. We take things as they come. We don't rebel easily. And we, we accept things the way it comes to us. A very important issue is that in, the, in India particularly, everything foreign has an element of greater viability. So it, it was like good old times when we were in school and colleges in India. Imported stuff is better than Indian stuff. So if something is quoted in New York Times or Washington Post or Economist or BBC, it becomes a kind of a gospel truth. And we make that as a measure of where we stand. And that is the part which must change in us. Because this is important for us to know that we have to verify whether what is written has a motivated element or there is an element of truth in it. Let's contest the truth. Let us stand up against the wrong items. So for example, my thought process is, is that when the Western media preaches to India and tries to sermonize that we have to protect the human rights, we have to uphold our high ground and everything else, which is great. Nobody's saying it's not. But are you, are, is New York Times, is Washington Post, is Pramila Jaipal, is Ro Khanna, and you know, Ami Bera, whoever they are, when was the last time they passed a Congress resolution condemning Chinese human rights violations? When was the last time they did a resolution to condemn minority butchering that happened in Pakistan and other places. We have lost, India has lost a lot of ground. You know, as one of the very famous guys wrote an article that Bhutto's thousand year war has still 70 years to go or 40 years to go, 940 years to go. And I contested that in reality, Bhutto and Islam won its first thousand year war with India because we created two countries where none existed and that to Islamic countries. Afghanistan has Kandahar, Bamiya Temple, they were all Hindu areas. We have conceded a lot. Thus, it is important for us all Indians to question the veracity of the attacks on us and also ask them, when was the last time you talked about China, Pakistan, and Middle East and other countries? I fully agree with you. But the, like I said before, the Western media will continue testing India because they know this is a land of tolerance. So they know in the West, if anybody is told Pakistan, just like a Rorschach test, everybody will know it is a land of terrorists. It is a land of barbaric terrorism. China, it is a land where human rights are oppressed. Everybody knows that to the max. So now the Western media knows that their journalists who are in China or who are in Pakistan, if they talk anti-Chinese to a, of a certain dimension, they will maybe put in jail. And a lot of them have been put to jail. They will be not given privileges, journalistic privileges. While in India, they know they India will tolerate everything. India will continue giving them right. India will give them right to go and shout in the front of the face of the Prime Minister and say you are a terrorist, you created the riot. Such is the land of India. So because they know they are able to do that, it is like a litmus test. They will continue testing you out how much you will tolerate. And it is right that we now need to, the government of India needs to start oppressing it, start uh, printing out articles about it, how these people have just zeroed in and started taking advantage of India because of this tolerance, land of tolerance. Yeah. And this, this is a, the, the word tolerance, you know, it says a very dangerous word. It's dangerous not because toleration is bad, but it has a negative connotation. We are a land of tolerance, we actually we are a land of acceptance and respect. 
we give that to people who come and they abuse us. It is, that's the history of India. So much so that it, is, it, it baffles your general intelligence at times that when Arundhati Roy and the Hollywood, uh, Bollywood uh, actors begin to talk about as if they are in threat, mm. as if the entire human race is under threat because of Hinduism or because of RSS. I mean, think about it like this. Pakistan Prime Minister makes a stupid statement that the world leadership needs to awaken to the RSS, otherwise Muslims will be the biggest genocide they will enjoy. That's an improbable assertion, which is a lie, and we must contest that. You cannot eliminate 150 million people who are living in a country. There cannot be a genocide in the country. Hindus are not against Muslims. Hindus are against terrorism. And that's part of the thing that message has to be, messaging has to be out. That we are not against Muslims. We have never been. I mean, India has had so many successful Muslim film actors, defense forces, sportsmen, movies, and they have prospered. Did anybody, you know, do what Dinesh Kanaria, the Pakistani cricketer, had to go through? That they would not even sit and eat with him. Whereas Salman Khan and Shah Rukh Khan are famous because Hindus watch their movies. That is the messaging that we have to put forth. And you are right about that. that they are somewhere along the line. Our acceptance and tolerance is abused and we are not responding. So they consider to feel that Indian and Hindus are up for a happy hunting ground. Beat them up, they will listen. And that's what bothers me is that these are the people who are Jaichand like. This Arundhati Roy, had she been making these kind of baloney statements mm. or instigating people not to register or give fake names, they would be hanging upside down in any other country. Uh, you're absolutely correct. Uh, she is then cashing on it. She knows by doing that, she'll be able to get more namesake, more prosperity and more fame. And she media is, attention, so to say. Absolutely. But how do we explain, this is also a very important point to do about it, that Hollywood stars, Nasiruddin Shah, and I'm naming them, not because of fear, nor am I outing them, but these are the people who had made statements that India is no longer safe for them. Now, which part of India is not safe for you? That is the issue that has to be talked about, and they need to be outed. That's what was the point which I'm trying to make, is that somewhere along the line, somewhere along the line, the media is now concerned that with the election of Boris Johnson in, in, in UK, with uh, Trump in United States and Modi, three prominent democracies of the world are clearly right of center. So the left definitely fears that their agenda will be decimated if these three people perform. So Brexit, which was in trouble all this while, is happening. Trump is doing what he is doing. So is the hatred is about the person specific or is it the philosophy? No, the, uh, it is both. I think it is the person specific. But if tomorrow Modi goes and Mr. Shah comes in, I think it will be even more tougher. Yeah. But uh, it is person specific and at the same time, it has, they have perceived that based on social media, the Hindutva movement or people realizing how long they have been oppressed and how <laughs> long they have been taken advantage of, that consolidation has happened. So they are afraid of that part too. Hindus were always divided, divide and rule. That was the one-liner that Rajendra Prasad wrote in order to win the ICS exam results. Uh, ICS. So this is what the British philosophy was. This was the philosophy of the Muslims. This was the divide the Hindus and rule them. And they are going to see that that's not happening anymore because of the consolidation based on the digital media, based on people aggregating together and uh, being easily educated about the common cause. That's brilliant because that's what I feel so too because you know it is one of my favorite things is that you may have heard it in the past as well is that 1941 census ought to be the eye opener for every Indian in India or anywhere in the world. 1941 census if you just google and look up there were just about 145,000 British plus women and children who ruled the country of millions. Divide and rule was really brutally done in India and we let that happen. And at that time, because 
the environment was different, even then we allowed ourselves to be ruled by them. And that is our weakness. So it's not that the Indians did not have bravery or valor, but we lost because we were not united. Today, as Deepak rightly said, that digital environment allows consolidation and unity. So unity, the Indians, what must they bear in mind? That unity is the strength and the strength in, in unity need not remain only a story in Panchatantra. We have to apply it in real life. So it is, that's very important. Your thought on that. Correct. I mean, and what has happened based on social media, people are able to process things. People are able to make comments. Then people, observers are able to reflect on it. And then, yes, there are immediate people who react, but other people who are sitting silent are noting everything. And out of processing comes the final distilled product that how we have been always taken advantage of how for the last thousand years a civilization which was absolutely non-violent mm -hmm. which was which based on knowledge which based which was based on pure knowledge the imagine the golden gupta age the last time the hindus ruled before those people came it was a civilization which was full of education, knowledge, tolerance for each other, respect for the neighbors, and everything that is mentioned in the Ten Commandments were followed by the Hindus on their own. And then comes, comes this barbaric invasion one after another, and without, and they dividing us, ruling us, converting us, the higher caste people being able to stay together based on their knowledge, the lower caste people were converted by force, were, butchered and uh, the properties were seized and India has gone through a lot because of that and finally Prime Minister Modi has awakened us has awakened us and has put it all together for us that now is the time that you can build your Ram Mandir you can be secular you can respect each other but you do not have to be taken advantage of you. You can have your own space and let them have their right. space and right. respect each other. Right. No, that is very important because this awakening that has happened, that Prime Minister Modi in the Indian context, you know, he created a cohesive narrative about India by traveling as much as he did. People poo pooed him. People kind of made a statement that he's an NRA Prime Minister. But think about it like this that how the narrative of India has changed. When Mamta Banerjee's minister threatened Amit Shah, his official trip to Bangladesh was canceled. I cannot imagine this would have happened in Congress government. So world leadership is listening to Modi. They recognize his United Nations speech in which he invited the world to come and participate in Make in India and how his entire initiative was so much pro-people and pro-India. One thing which really bothers me about it, you alluded to that in terms of uh, conversion. You use the word conversion. That brings me to another thought here. Hindus are Sanatan Dharmas. For us, whether what you pray, when you pray, how many times you pray, just didn't matter. Good. So long as you were doing Absolutely. good, got the best out of you. So we have been religiously accepting any faith anywhere, India is home to all persecuted religions in the world. That's a historical fact. Absolutely. Now that brings me to another issue. Is freedom of religion, which in my opinion is essentially a Western concept. Freedom of religion is a Western concept enshrined in constitution of many countries. Is it relevant for us? Do we have to kind of give Islam and Christianity come and convert as if our people are available for conversion. Is that, does there, is there a need to re reconfigure this entire conversion issue in the Indian context? I'm glad you mentioned this because look, in Hinduism, they had always talked about how you are always born as a Hindu. You cannot convert to a Hindu. A Christian cannot be converted to Hinduism and Islam where a Muslim cannot become a Hindu. So Hinduism never believed in conversion. It never believed it was, it was a way of life. And this whole thing of taking Hindus and converting them, 
there is always a secondary reward system which could be in the form of power, which could be in the form of money, which could be in form of, but there is a transaction going on for this conversion. I dare say there will be very few Hindus who converted to any other religion purely because they idealize that religion of Islam or religion of Christianity. There is always a secondary reason why they are doing so. And at some level, we have to blame ourselves. It is the Hindu upper caste who has not been able to keep them together. I mean, our these concepts in rural temples, the, the chief priest of the temple tell, telling the lower caste, imagine you are in a rural village and you have a beautiful temple and the lowest caste is said you have to sit out there. You cannot come inside. The God blessings this, are not for you. you this, yeah, the right, inclusiveness right. was not right, there. Right. And you push them away and the, the, the Christian says, you come, we'll give you money, we'll give you education, we will do this for you. And there is all this element of bribing, what is, is a secondary phenomena. So the, the conversion happened because of that. They took advantage of our uh, priest and upper caste not being able to include them in our Hinduism. And that, that has to be worked on. Here is a very interesting element. I mean, we, we know that there was you know, strictures on them about entering temple or the premises that was, they're not right. God belongs to everybody and everybody can pray from wherever it is. It was wrong. There is no way anybody can justify that it was right. However, there's another important part, which we don't talk about, is in Islam itself, Sunnis, Shias, Ahmadiyas, Aga Khani, I mean, they kill each other. So when the conversion happens, what are you converting to? That's also another issue to be talked about. And to that end, my, my message to all Indians is that we must, as a collective, say that we have no persecution of religion. We have no, we have acceptance of every faith. So all these conversion specialists that come and they do all kinds of drama, that must stop. We'll continue this dialogue right after this short break. Welcome back. This year is ending and so is this decade. The world has emerged out of teens and is emerging into 2020. Sign of maturity? Hopefully so. So we'll talk about, about what are the events, I would say, what are the events of 2019 which were very important, which will have forward effect, impact and implication of life around, and what are the decadal items? What happened in 2019? that caught your attention and you think and you hope it doesn't happen or if it happens, it happens in a better way. So I will kick off on this one. I would say the decade item of uh, the entire scenario was the mass shootings in America. For me, that is a very important event. Why do people kill? Why do people kill in schools? Why? People talk about gun violence, restrictions on gun freedom. When the VIPs and congressmen and senators have their own security with gun, ordinary people don't have the right to protect themselves or do they need to? That's a very important, because that, that pursuit of life, liberty and happiness, if there is no life, there is no liberty, there is no pursuit of happiness. So for me, mass violence in the United States, and I will put mass violence in the category of terrorism as well. Will you terrorists take away innocent lives? A religion that, that motivates people, and I use the word motivation in a sad way, when it prepares innocent children to maim and kill in public squares, that's a sure sign of brainwashing. So the gun violence of the kind, I'm including terrorism, and the Civil Act. For me, that was a standout event and that will create division amongst people because we are going to become an island if this kind of a violence continues. For you, Deepak, what would come up to you as a, the item of the decade? For me, the item of the decade, being a student of science, has been cancer immunotherapy, for which the Nobel Prize was given last year. We have finally come back, which started in 1911, that based on your own immune system, you can 
completely cure, and I'm not talking about prevention or keeping it in remission, totally cure at least nine horrible cancer. And in this coming decade, we expect most of the cancer being permanently being treated, just like antibiotics treated bug disease, tuberculosis, where people died. For me, that was the biggest achievement that we saw in this decade from 2010 to 2020. So Funny you said that because knowing you as a doctor, I was going to ask you if you had not said this, that in the field of medicine, what has been the biggest thing that to happen? You know, I remember I, I, that health is important, you know. People are going to live longer and people are living longer now. So, you know, the, you know this uh, mortality rates have, the age has gone up remarkably. Well, in the business sense, if people are going to live longer, they are not going to live, once I'm 80 years of age, I'm not going to live the life of 16 or 20. We will need help. Does this give a new opportunity for new businesses of elder care or you know, long-term care and whatever? How is that business going to shape up in the years to come? Well, many things will happen concurrently. So like we always knew we had electrical engineering, mechanical and civil engineering. So in the world of aging also, things are approached at multi-dimension. So you have now stem cell research which happened and stem, stem cell treatment which happened in the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. So you, based on your own stem cell, you will be able to put a new uh, kidney, a new liver, your own generated liver, your own kidney, your own set of eyes, cataract, retina, your uh, hips. So things which were always leading to acute problems in old age would be created using your own stem cells and then transplanted so you live longer along with that you will need psychosocial uh, approach that means how will you live as a community now that you have raised your kids your kids are gone and they're living independently how we would be dealing with in assisted living facilities how will 100 Indians living together in the United States be able to deal with each other and live in harmony and peace. That those are will be new therapies that will be uh, implemented and people will talk about that. Uh, psychologically, how will, although you would have new body parts, you would have new body organs, you would need resources and how different people would have different amount of resources until on, until we have Medicare for all, which I don't think will happen in the very near future, but it will be these resources which will be varied and different, which will give to other challenges. And, and this is, that, that's very powerful. You know, I, I was part of a think tank where ten years ago we talked about designer treatments. This is part of the thing that you are talking. Ten years ago we talked about designer treatments coming, and that was also triggered by scientific and medicinal advancement in which one of the Bond movies, uh, James Bond has to go through a scanner, 3D scanner where his whole body is scanned through that and they know exactly what the problem is. Are they real or are they going to be commonplace or can my body be fixed? And there is an important issue here. And I will say this with a little tongue in cheek remark. What good is my life of 100 years or 120 years if my performance in boardroom and bedroom doesn't become better. <laughs> <laughs> well, both are achievable. First of all, already now is the standard executive physical therapy in the United States. After age 60, you go through an yearly whole body CT scan and a whole body PET scan to pick up any early signs of any malignant cells or any chronic disorders picking up. That is now standard therapy. It is not covered by insurance. It costs you an extra four grand, four thousand dollars, and it is routinely done by most people of high income. So, so we are seeing that that will happen. Now, people with better resources will get their new organs transplanted and implanted. People will see. As imagine now, you have a complete cure of lung <coughs> cancer, but it cost you almost two million dollars. The whole treatment cost you $2 million. If you do not have insurance, you are a bad, out of luck. People are coming from India and getting, going to Sloan, giving the $2 million check and getting the treatment done and getting them totally cured. So things have 
happened. Resources will become an important issue. And, but there will be a lot of new, you will have automated car, you will have digital media taking care of each other, GoFundMe will become a regular issue. Right now, anybody who is wrongly persecuted, who, is, who becomes sick, they just open a GoFundMe account, $100,000 comes in and you immediately go for treatment. That w those are the new ways how sh socialization will happen, how people instead of using communist techniques will use digital media and platform to be, uh, go and take advantage of new technologies. Brilliant. Friends, there is hope for better health in the future, which is great. Let's shift to the decade and 2019 <coughs> political impact. From my point of view, the election of Mr. Modi is a decade, it's in 2019. 2014, he won again. Trump won in 2016. As things stand, he might win 2020. But, uh, Johnson has won in UK. These are all people who are right of center. Is the political narrative changing? Because there is a law of physics that every action has an equal and opposite reaction. So the rise of these three people in these three countries, is it a reaction to the extreme liberalism that we see today? Because I don't understand that liberals, they call themselves party of love and they behave so hateful. Liberals call them freedom of speech, but they won't let a conservative speak in their colleges and other campuses. On the contrary, they disturb. Has this shifted for real? Well, I think, like you said, as a law of physics, what goes up must come down and what goes down must come up. Yeah. That will and happen. And we, we convert that into management mm -hmm. jargon that every trend has a counter trend. Correct. The, so that will happen. What had happened in the, uh, before uh, President Trump came in, we had President Obama who had switched the country extremely to the left. And I dare say uh, after Trump came, they even pushed it even a lot more to the left. And I think um, you are absolutely correct. At least the bookies are all booking that Trump is going to win. Those is how the bookers have uh, booked it, and so he's going to win. But uh, I'm sure after his eight years, we'll again start seeing the left coming up, and uh, like, and that keeps this country beautiful. That keeps the pond clean. The dirty water must go, and the clean water must come the in. The cyclical movement of politics yeah, that, in and out. Uh, yes. <laughs> And that was we our uh, uh, Mahesh, Vishnu, and Shiv. You know what I mean. We have a law creator. Yeah. We have a maintenance person mm -hmm. and a destroyer, and mm -hmm. like everything else in life. There is another issue which is very important, which is a uh, year uh, 2019, and has future impact on man-woman relationship, and that refers to Me Too movement. Now we know that men are responsible for lots of abuse of women's rights sexually, mentally, and otherwise. Men have been responsible for that. But this movement will dramatically change the human relationship between man and woman. And as we see in movies these days, a lot of women are into active fight roles. And the traditional, you know, heroine, hero, love story is over. Women trained well, they can be as lethal as a man trained well. Maybe at an equal level, they may not be able to match each other, but it's important in terms of human relationship and human dynamics. Your thought on that? In this point, I will disagree with you. This is the only point I'll disagree Fine. with you. Because in the Me Too movement, I see is a very rightful movement. I have yeah, yeah, already, I agree. Yeah, let, I let, have, me, <laughs> let me first say that straight away. I'm not saying it is wrong. Yeah. I'm uh, talking about the uh, effects uh, of that. Yeah. 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 So e even in the Me Too movement, if men is more careful that when they, trust me, most human being, our sixth sense is so strong, we know what is right and what is wrong. G given the fact that once in a while there can be a mental uh, psych case of a woman, we know when we are touching somebody with endearment versus we are touching with the pineal gland. Our pineal gland, which is the third eye in Hinduism, t tells us that this has been touched sexually, this has been touched with endearment, this has been touched with affection, this has been... So we are able to be able to differentiate between these shades of grey. 
and women can most women can perceive that and are able to reciprocate equally or get agitated equally so i truly believe in that i think most of us are uh, we have that quality of judgment both men and female and we know when we have touched somebody aggressively sexually with love as a brother as a father and we have all that as about them becoming strong i think there is a lot of attraction in f we are finding a female equally strong there is a, you i have perceived the females who are cerebrally mentally strong who are physically strong but are able to maintain their femininity at the same time outbits any women who are not mentally strong True. or who are not physically strong True. and that that has there is a new element of attraction based on those forces because everybody likes a strong person everybody likes a confident person everybody likes a person who can take care of their space and who can take care of their own territory and i totally agree the me too movement has been a remarkable movement primarily because it brings about the respect factor you got to respect people and all men must remember one thing is and is a very simple fact the any woman that you have an ulterior motive to insult humiliate or whatever remember she is somebody's mother somebody's wife somebody's daughter or somebody's sister and that can happen to you so the question here is the respect that women deserve they it ought to be given and i applaud people who came out and spoke about it so right. history is full of examples political history is full of examples of how politicians abuse their position of power and authority we had our own jhansi ki rani yes and jhansi ki rani was followed by thousands of absolutely. male absolutely. soldiers yes, absolutely. and they loved to be correct. loved the fact that she was in command correct so <laughs> th th there is an element of that and i think this is a wonderful thing to happen deepak thank you very much for coming today wishing you mm. a wonderful new year and uh, to you and your family and to next decade and we will meet again thank you friends for being with us i really appreciate that thank you once again for being with us thank you very much happy new year and a happy new decade